Hello and welcome to the AV Fortnite's podcast for Monday the 25th of September. And joining me in this edition, Assistant Editor Steve Withers. You bring the equipment, I'll bring my balls. News Editor Mark Hodgkinson. If you die, you can have your apartment. On your review, Ed Sally. Somehow we brought our sins back physically, and they're pissed. And special guest star, Mark Butwright. Turd face. Thanks, Mark. Right, so uh, we are all confirmed for CES. It's only 108 days to oh. to go. <laughs> that's that's the best feature on their website is the countdown. It's it's fantastic. It tells you how many days you've got to go till hell. At least you, you're not there for the whole thing, Ed. This year, you're only no, 108 days to go, and I, at, at this at the time of recording, I still can't walk. <laughs> yeah, this 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 is a concern. But obviously, we we were discussing this this morning. If we can get you on one of these uh, obese mobiles, at least we could use you as a dolly. You know, so it gets some, just get some nice, get some really nice tracking shots. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I still plan that it's going to be fine. I don't want to be on an obesicle. Can I at least have a segue? I can stand up. Yeah, um, but uh, I'd have... actually pay money to see you on a. Segway, yeah, I, so I would yes. as well, actually. Yeah, <laughs> well, absolutely. There you go. I'll, get him I'll... on one of the mobility ones, and then he might be able to get to the front of all the queues as well. Well, we, funnily enough, we we said that it'd be like the Red Sea part, and we should just put him in front of us, and we'll get everywhere we need to go really quickly because the crowds would just part. So There's, in other words, Steve, Steve I am on a... the back, like on the back of someone's BMX with stump. <laughs> <laughs> the megaphone. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. So the the me- the motto of this is that I don't regain the ability to walk. We're just we're going we're going all in on 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 the on the on the fake disability because that's a classy look for any forum. Yeah. No. That that'd be great because then we can park wherever we like as well, Ed. And seeing you hobbling out, that you know we wouldn't get questioned for parking in disabled bay. Yes. Right. Well, on that on that happy, sh- I shall I shall bet take that under advisement. I think is the uh, <laughs> is the polite phrase, and we'll see where we go from there. I, so basically, since you're not available next Friday because you're having your operation, we're all hoping it goes horribly wrong. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, thanks a bunch, darling. Um, yeah, that, that, that was really nice to say that to your colleague, Steve. <laughs> You're only having some pins removed, aren't you? Two screws are being taken out. Right. So, have you had your MRSA tests back? I have. I, I'm delighted to say my groin is entirely MRSA free. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, that's it's have good that music. embroidered on a pillow. <laughs> I want a certificate. No, we'll, we'll get we'll get your t-shirt. I'm MRSA free. Well, let's wait until I come out of hospital for the second time, shall we? Again, <laughs> you're more likely to catch it in the hospital than anywhere yeah. else. <laughs> Chickens hatched, etc. So, yeah, let's see how we get on. But yes, I won't be. I won't be in the podcast next week, uh, listeners, because um, I will be undergoing day surgery. So, uh, I, I need to ask them if I'm allowed to keep the screws. Uh, but we, I bet you, I'm probably not. But we'll see how we go. Do not just do the podcast before the surgery and, and do it on the pre-med, so you're a bit high. It'll be quite good fun. I think. Uh, no, because I'd be on the hospital wireless, which I can assure you is make, <laughs> makes yours look like, you know, Blade Runner. So we'll, we'll see how we go. I don't think that's going to work, I'm afraid. Did they have wireless in Blade Runner? No. <laughs> CRT tellies as well. Yeah. Isn't, isn't it funny that films, sci-fi films from the 80s, I mean, obviously Blade Runner stands up really well. We're going to come onto this later on. But none of them foresaw the mobile phone. Not in no. the sense that we use them now. The closest anyway. I've seen to that kind of... Uh, sort of prediction would have been probably Space 1999 where they had their personal communicators which were kind of like ugly I'm sure, I'm, sure, I'm sure Star Trek did it before that oh well, and obviously Star Trek had their communicators yeah I mean that was back in the 60s Steve couldn't play Angry Birds on them though could you <laughs> no <laughs> and uh, at the time of recording the new iPhone is is whisking its way out to owners uh, as we speak this, we're recording this on a Friday morning uh, our review is up there it'll still be there on Monday uh, by David Phelan. David has spent quite a bit of time with uh, with the iPhone 8 and the iPhone 8 Plus. He, went, he was lucky enough to get out to Cupertino for the launch and so on. Um, so the review's up there, if you're interested in it. I mean, we all slagged it off last week <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and said it wasn't worth the money. But um, but actually, the iPhone 8 comes in at 699 so it's not as the bad as... The iPhone 8's not that bad. It's yeah. the X. The it's 10, the X. Sorry, the yeah. iPhone 10 that's, um, that's quite pricey. Although, having said that, I mean, I mean obviously... We'll wait and see what David thinks of the 10, because, you know, if it's a staggering piece of technology, then maybe it's worth nearly a grand. Who yeah. knows? Yeah. St- we... no, Steve's, not Steve's, Steve's turning already. <laughs> let's not prejudge. <laughs> I'll tell you what, I was well close to ordering an Apple TV. <laughs> it wasn't wow. for the fact there's a, del- you know, there's a back order now that put me off, but uh, it, it's going to happen. It's inevitable. I just get annoyed at electronics. I can't get a trade, a trade price on these days. It's like, no, not happening. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, good luck with that with Apple. Right, moving well, on. Yeah. Uh, competition time. Mr. Botwright, tell us all about it. Um, just the one. Uh, you can win a copy of Lethal Weapons Season 1 on Blu-ray, and that one closes on 29th of September. Lethal Weapon Season 1? What? This is... This is There's a television now. version of Lethal Weapon. And actually, do you know what? Apparently, it's it's pretty good. Didn't watch it, but <laughs> the reviews were quite positive. So. It was on ITV, so I didn't watch it, but apparently it's actually very good. And it's on Blu-ray, the, you know. So, fr- I mean, you know, we, we, it's got quite a modern price. When, when reviewing anything, when the phrase apparently pops up too many times in the reviews, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's very good. No. Like I read, a, there was an online uh, line about a, a Shia LaBeouf film the other day, which was, uh, he shines in adequate film <laughs> <laughs> well that has me beating a path to the cinema so uh, yes there we go uh, previous competition winners mark uh, none right okay so we can move on swiftly to hardware news going to go to mark first the media box I mean Steve's already alluded to the Apple uh, TV 4k that he's going to go and buy one it's priced at 179 pounds and lo and behold mark the Nvidia shield uh, turns up at that price but remote only yeah, exactly that. I mean, it's an obvious uh, answer to a riposte, should I say, to uh, Apple's um, launch today or last Friday, if you listen to it on Monday. A uh, previous version of the 16 gigabytes Shield TV from NVIDIA uh, came with a remote as well as a games controller uh, at £189. And uh, NVIDIA have taken the bold step of shaving precisely £10 off the cost and shedding the games controller into the bargain. Um, I don't think it's I don't think it's a particularly attractive deal, I have to say. For 10 quid difference. For 10 quid, no. I mean, that, that games controller is a really good games controller and it retails for 60 quid on the UK NVIDIA store. So you would have thought they could maybe shave a little bit more than £10 off it. I mean, I don't know whether it's it's the idea that when that when people are going shopping and doing comparisons, they want to be on a par with the with the new Apple TV price-wise. To su- suggesting Why didn't they just a, take the full NVIDIA Shield and drop the price by £10? Then for the I, I don't know what... I, yeah, I don't, I don't know what they're thinking, really. It's, it just seems it just seems like a very... A very... I don't know. It, it makes the one with the controller seem a bargain, though. If you, yeah, if you consider that you've got parity at the same price as Apple TV, and then you say just for ten more, you get this one with a you know with the the games controller. Mm. Yeah, and I would argue it was. It, it just seems like a half-assed move, just knocking a knocking a tenner off. When it, it assumes that people are aren't going to look around, aren't going to you know come, do a proper their proper research and discover that there's a, there's a model where you could buy a games controller and then shift that on if you wanted for, for easily for thirty quid on eBay or whatever and, and be in profit. So I don't know. I, I it's um it, it just seems like a, a just a, like they're running scared a bit almost from from the Apple TV. They're obviously obviously the uh, Dolby Vision and HDR capabilities have, and their low prices on iTunes has got them slightly worried. I think I think they've had the top end of the market to themselves for for at least two years really um and and as far as i know it sells really well the nvidia shield particularly in in, in america um so yeah it just it just seems strange they came up with them um, with a a comparison between the between the two uh, which is quite Nvidia centric, it has to be said. Uh, obviously, <laughs> yeah, obviously, which you would do, and, and, and some of the points are, are totally fair. Um, but they've 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 clicked Amazon Video at 1080p on the Apple TV, and it and apparently it will be 4K before very long. They've said YouTube is going to be 1080p only. Well, well, there is a 4K version coming for sure. Um, they've also listed pluses as the private listening feature through the headphone jack as a, as a positive for the Shield, but that doesn't. That's only on the games controller, so you'd have to buy it for the game. <laughs> you'd have to buy that version for, it, for, that, for that to be relevant. Um, yeah, I, I just, I just, I'm quite surprised Nvidia have done this. Really, it, it, it's if they're going to do it, then you know, shave 20, 30 quid off and don't don't shave a tenner. Okay, so uh, that's the Nvidia Shield tenner knocked off. Uh, what a bargain! Not uh, moving on. We've got another TV in for review. We're, you know, September. Uh, normally we're done with all the TVs, but uh, Steve, you've got another Samsung in. Yeah, late September, and this is the second Samsung TV that I've seen this year. But normally by now we'd have seen a dozen Samsung tellies, uh, which is a bit unusual. Um, I don't actually know why it's taken so long. Um, I think they've had a few software issues, maybe, that have delayed things. Anyway, finally got one in. It's the MU7000. So this is the sort of uh, mid-tier range. sits below the QLED, so it doesn't have quantum dot. Um, but otherwise, it's it's a fully spec'd 
Samsung TV, so it supports HDR10. Obviously, you'll be getting HDR10 Plus with a firmware update, late, firmware update later. And it includes their um, Tizen powered operating system. And it's, uh, you know, I've actually found it to be a really good TV, really solid telly. Um, nice picture quality, excellent accuracy out of the box, which I was pleased to see. Um, they've been, they've obviously been, they've been improving the input lag because uh, I think maybe pushed on by the fact that uh, LG were pulling in 21 milliseconds because I measured this telly at 17.3 milliseconds mark marks, uh, which I think, and correct me if I'm wrong here, is the lowest I've ever measured any any display at in terms of input lag. Have you ever did got one lower than six, that? Didn't we have one at 16 once? Did you once? Maybe. Yeah, was, that, that, was that pre-Leo Bodner, though? No, post-Leo Bodner. Anyway, 17.3 milliseconds, that is, that is seriously low input lag. So uh, if, you're, if you're a gamer looking for a TV, then this would definitely be uh, on your list because, um, you know, as I say, it's a cracking telly. It's a good all-rounder, nice picture, good accuracy out of the box. It's got HDR support. It's not the brightest. I mean, this is only, I'm only getting 570 nits, so it isn't that bright. But um, Samsung's local dimming is excellent. You can't turn it off, um, which is annoying when you're trying to calibrate it. Um, although, obviously, once you, you know, for most people, they'll have it on anyway. I'd recommend using it because it is really good and you, and you can't not use it. But the low setting is excellent. You get really good blacks. It's really effective. And um, despite the limited peak brightness and limited color gamut, because as I said, it doesn't have a, a quantum dot. So um, it isn't as wide a color gamut as some of the other TVs we've measured. It still delivers a, a, a really good performance with HDR. And uh, yeah, I, I really thought it's 1,200 quid, 1,150 pounds actually currently on John Lewis. So um, it's a good price, 55 inch. And um, and like I said, a good feature set, good performance, solid performer, really low input lag. And um, and yeah, it's I think it's a, a really solid TV, good all-rounder, and uh, definitely worth considering. Uh, Seven Series has always been a bit of a sweet spot, hasn't it? Has, yes, it has. Edgelet, Steve, so where are the, where are the Edge, uh, LEDs? They're on the bottom. They're they're on on the the bottom. bottom. Right, yeah. okay. Any I mean, issues? All, I think all Samsung's TVs are Edgelet this year. There isn't a single um, full array backlight model um, available, unfortunately. So it's all Edgelet, but yeah, they're all on the bottom. Bit. Right, and any issues with that, Steve, in terms of cloud and uniformity, that kind of thing? Uniformity was really good, actually. I've got to say, obviously, when you're watching HDR, um, you do get a little bit of, um, because they're along the bottom, <laughs> you do get occasional uh, haloing and, and slight columns from where the, the lights are. So it's it's not, I mean, I wouldn't, you know, it's not ideal having them along the bottom. But I have to say the uniformity was actually pretty good, especially with SDR content. Um, it, it, as I say, their, their local dimming actually is very effective and it worked really well. When you start pushing the brightness, obviously you're going to get a bit more halo because you've got the uh, backlight and the local dimming in its high setting. Um, but overall, uh, I, I've got to say, um, it, it's, it performed as well as the Q8 that I saw um, earlier in the year. So uh, yeah, I think I think for the money, it's uh, it's a cracking little deal. And what about a dirty screen effect and, and banding for football and that kind of thing? No, it was uh, it was pleasingly free of banding actually. I have to say on on the footy, um, and no 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 obvious DSE. Uh, so whatever Samsung are doing in terms of their panels, that they they at least are delivering a consistent uh, experience, um, which is pleasing to see. Um, and uh, even in a darkened room, uh, it still it still held up well. Is this the one? Uh, have they shifted the legs on this one? Yeah, it's got so the it's uh, out wide, and they've they've uh, like um, cable management that kind of thing. They've yeah yeah. So there's there's, there's, there's there's feet at either end, basically, of the panel, which has kind of become quite trendy, although it is a bit annoying for people because obviously you need quite a wide surface to put telly on unless you're going to wall mount it. Um, if you want to wall mount it, it's got 400 by 400 Visa um, mounts on the rear. Um, yeah, and it's got uh, the one connect box. So there's a, uh, that you can you connect, connect it basically to the, the one connect box to the TV with a single cable, plus there's also a power cable going to TV. So there's only two cables going to TV. And there is a removable panel at the rear, so you can hide them away if you want to. Um, and uh, the, yeah, the box has got four HDMI inputs and three USB. Well, there's two USB ports on the box. There's also one USB port on the TV, actually, on the TV. And also that's where you'll find the CI slot and the Ethernet port. But yeah, it does mark as the, the wider part feet. I think, um, is it the so, only one in the Samsung range that has that? Uh, I'm thinking the I ones think below I, the 6400 or whatever had the central. All the ones that I've seen other than this model do have a, a more, you know, more central traditional stand. Um, certainly the Q series does, and I think the model below did as well. Um, so the uh, what's below that six four hundred, six five hundred. I haven't. Uh, yeah, I think you might be right, Mark. I think you might. This is the only one that uses the wider part feet, which don't, by the way, bizarrely don't screw in. You just sort of shove them in, and that's it. <laughs> There's no screws. Um, they seem to stay in reasonably well. You just have to shake them to get them out again when you're taking it apart. 
if you have to take it apart, because obviously most people won't. Yeah, you, you need to remember that point, Steve. You're the only one that builds <laughs> builds them and dismantles I, I, I them as quickly. On each, stood on each foot and just lifted the panel. <laughs> Christ. <laughs> That's quite effective. Still, still giving him an extra point if it's a light TV. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, you're true. But also, also, when I was putting it together, I was like, oh, wow, there's, there's no screws. But when I was taking it apart, I was quite pleased there were no screws. <laughs> so, win some, lose some. <laughs> Yep, okay, so that's uh, the Samsung MU7000. It's on the site now as you listen to the podcast, so go and read the review if you want to know any more about that one. Um, Projector-wise, so we talked a little while back about the Acer 4K DLP projector, how it was a little bit overpriced um, in terms of the the value for money aspect when compared with the competition. I've seen a few others now. I actually had a BenQ turn up. It was the, uh, I think it was the X12000 and uh, it turned up and the same day it turned up it was withdrawn from circulation and I had to send it back without looking at it. Uh, but it was priced at £9,000 for a 4K DLP projector. Yours. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm not so sure that would have gotten such a positive review actually. I'll never know though. It was never tested. So I've actually had another Acer in and the projector I'm going to talk about now is the Optoma UHD65. Optoma have always been uh, great when it comes to DLP projectors. They've always been uh, value for money uh, in terms of performance. They've always taken the performance um, aspect really seriously in terms of ISF C3 and having calibration controls on, on their products and so on. The thing with these 4K DLP projectors and the reason why £9,000 for a BenQ seemed extortionate was the fact that all of these models are based on one of two platforms. So the bigger projectors like the V9800 from Acer and the uh, the big BenQ, they're based on a larger chassis which has um, horizontal and vertical uh, lens shift and this is how you tell them apart because it has the two uh, dials on the top of the body and then the other model like the UHD 65, the UHD 60 from Optoma and the Acer uh, 7850 V7850 um, is based on another chassis they all run the same software they all have very very similar uh, picture settings uh, presets are, are, are almost named the same and you get the same type of stuff in there um, so basically what you're getting is is not a lot of personalization other than the coming different different chassis uh, designs um but all the technology in them is the same and so on so this is 4k dlp does the pixel shift there's 4.1 million mirrors um they claim that that puts up 8.3 million pixels on screen it's not native 4k uh, but because it's a single chip and uh, uh, unlike the competition like the epson tw models like the TW7300 and 9300 and the JVC which are three chip uh, projectors this is a single chip which means it's really really sharp and and the image looks really sharp because you don't have any alignment issues and so on so that's a big plus point when it comes to 4k DLP it's bright it's rated at 2200 lumens but actually uh, if you want anything that looks accurate without having overly blue whites and all the rest of it, you're probably talking about 900 to 1000 lumens once calibrated which is still pretty bright for a projector um, it will stand up pretty well in a room with ambient lighting because like all DLPs it's the black levels that suffer here um, so you don't get the, sh the kind of shadow detail that you would expect to see um, from from a projector if you're used to looking at an Epson or a JVC or a Sony um, they usually have excellent shadow detail retrieval on them um, nice black levels and so on the DLP models are a little bit um, brighter when it comes to uh, black levels but if you're using it in an ambient lit room or a room with ambient lighting or white walls and white ceiling and so on the room uh, already has a higher black floor so you tend to get away with it a bit more and if you're watching something like you know planet earth 2 or whatever that's shot in deserts and rainforests and all the rest of it, it looks absolutely stunning it looks really 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 nice it's when you get to the darker scenes like the villages like the, the shots with the hyena with the eyes and stuff if you're familiar with <laughs> planet earth 2 um, that's where it tends to tends to fall down because there is no shadow uh, detail in there so what you get is is a block of of dark grey basically, um, and in mixed scenes, if there's uh, bright and dark in the same scene, you usually find that there's a lot of what technically you call black crush going on there. Um, same with HDR, so it accepts HDR, so it ignores it, accepts uh, full 4K UHD. Um, it will read the metadata, um, and what it does is it tone maps the color to Rec 709, so it doesn't have wide color. 
there are modes on it where you can switch um, on what they call uh, pure engine drive, so you can switch on pure color and that kind of thing. All that does is it, it turns up the brightness on the colors. Um, it's it's not widening the gamut. So sadly, skin tones look really odd and things look overcooked and it just doesn't look right. Um, so don't touch any of those modes um, in these projectors at all. Use the native gamut, which is Rec. 709. It covers Rec. 709 uh, and that's just as good. At that price point, uh, if it can do that, then go with that rather than pressing these, you know, pure engine stuff and all the rest of it. Because, like I say, it just cooks the the luminance. It doesn't do anything in terms of actually expanding the saturation and the hue of of the colours. There, there is no expanded colour here. Um, HDR stuff. It for a projector, it looked okay. Um, obviously, the black level, the black floors raised um, naturally anywhere on the DLP. It doesn't exist, so. Um, what you're looking at is highlight detail and so on. You have to turn down the contrast a little to stop clipping. It will track the EOTF quite nicely, actually, out of the box. There's there's a couple of modes to that you can flick between, which basically just changes the the EOTF response. So one will track properly. The other one, it's more like an S curve, traditional S curve type gamma, where it does uh, crush even more in the blacks, and it actually crushes crushes at the higher end. Um, but given the price, it's three thousand pounds. There is some tough, tough competition on the market. It's up against. Um, like I say, if you've got a, a room with white walls, white ceiling, you can't really control the light that well, other than closing the curtains and so on. So the black floor is already raised in your room. You're probably not going to see the benefit of the Epson TW range or or the JVCs if that's your type of room, because their advantages are black levels, are uh, shadow detail retrieval, and that kind of thing. But if you've got a room like that, you're fighting against um, light flooding back onto the screen and probably raising the black floor on the screen uh, of, of the material you're watching. So in that respect, the Optoma does compete really quite well um, in that type of environment, in that type of room. If you have a dedicated room or a cinema room or a room where you have dark coloured walls, whether that's a dark grey or, or, or brown coloured walls, um, you can control the light, you have proper blackout blinds, that kind of thing, so you can get the black floor down really well. You will then, start, like our center room here, you will start to notice the uh, the deficiencies when it comes to black level and shadow detail retrieval and that kind of thing just not being there when compared to the, the likes of the Epson. And, and obviously we've got a JVC X7000 in this room here and, um, you know, in that environment, the differences are night and day because you're getting the absolute best out of the JVC in those conditions, whereas the Optoma is just not capable of it. But for for three thousand pounds, if you've got a room where you can't con like control and so on, it, it's actually good value. Um, unlike the the Acer that we reviewed before, which which was just a little bit too expensive for for what you were getting in terms of performance, especially the fact that there is no wide color. Um, so, so yeah, it's a cracking little machine and the review should be up by the time you listen to this podcast. Do you have any idea, Phil, why why they aren't able to deliver DCI-P3 on these projectors? Because, I mean, the JVC, for example, gets a color, percent It's a color wheel, color wheel, Steve. Yeah. So, the, I mean, they've only just managed in the last sort of three or four years at this price point and below, like the, the BenQ projectors that are around about £1,000, £2,000 price bracket, they've only just been able to expand them to cover Rec. 709. The, the, the problem yeah. you have with the color wheels is usually gray and um, green and cyan. Um, that's that's your issue. And um, if you try to go for accuracy in those areas with the color wheel, you're actually affecting the brightness. Because um, if you think about bright light, you know what makes up the majority of, of a bright light is is the green spectrum. That's normally where you get a lot of energy. Uh, especially from a UHP lamp, you get very little red and you get a lot of green and cyan in there. Um, so the color wheels, are, they're, they're just not able to get wide enough at the minute. Um, you'd be looking at a laser probably yeah. to yeah. get closer to uh, closer to the purity to get the wider color. And then you're talking even more money than what these projectors are at the minute. You've got to remember that these are the first um, TIXPR chips that are in these projectors. Um, it's, a, it's the first time it's come to market. And when you think about that, £4,000, £3,000, it doesn't seem that much money when you're talking about you know, new technology. It's just that if you have a cinema room where you, where you can control light, the Epsons and the JVCs and the Sonys perform better in terms of you know more depth to the image, more shadow detail retrieval, better black levels, better mixed scene 
uh, mixed contrast scenes and that kind of thing, they all struggle with HDR, all the projectors. Um, the only one I think we've seen that, that does a half decent job is the £30,000 JVC Z1. Um, I think that's the only one that's that's really sort of been able to do anything decent with HDR so far. So they yeah, all they all kind of struggle with that. So, but you know, it, it's horses for courses, and it's it's what suits the end user at the end of the day. If they if you have a, a room that you know you don't have permission to paint the walls black and put in a dark coloured carpet and paint the paint the the ceiling and all the rest of it. If you're in that type of environment, then the optoma starts to make really good sense and. And like I say, if you're watching something like Planet Earth or, or the majority of TV stuff, which is usually bright scenes anyway, and um, it, it does look bright, it looks crisp, it looks nice and sharp, the colours are accurate to 709, they're, they're very accurate, um, and, and it creates a really nice image. It's just, in a dedicated room, um, you will start to see the flaws and the competition's better at that point and will give you the wider colour and so on. So you make your choice, basically. I, I will be interested to see what you think of the laser projectors that are coming out um soon because uh because it seems to me that at the moment okay you've got the ti chip you're not really getting native 4k but you're getting a, a higher resolution experience but other than that and given that most films even now are still finished at 2k you're kind of not getting much else as far as you know you're not getting the white color gamut you're obviously not getting a very great hdr experience you kind of you have to debate whether it's worth investing in one at this point it, you know that that is going to be an issue for this like i say these are the first generation models to come through so next year you, you will hope that they'll move on the game the thing is with laser it's it's expensive um mm. so we're complaining at the minute at three thousand pounds it's no really good competition unless the environment suits it, it you, you they're not going to come in at three thousand pounds on a laser projector you're talking closer to 10 grand um i think epson managed to bring one to market for about six and a half that's the cheapest I've seen that technology. It'll be interesting to see where Sony bring theirs in. I've got a funny feeling that it's going to be 14, 15 grand. So it's still a lot of money. And the thing is, you know, with a projected image, you have to make your sacrifices. Um, if it's a projected image you want to go for, you want to go for a 10, 10 foot or a 12 foot screen, you want to go for scope, you want to go for that kind of thing. And that's another thing. These are all manual. So if you've got a scope screen, you have to manually change the zoom and the focus every time you want to move between aspect ratios. It doesn't have the memory stuff that the competition has at that price point. So yeah, I mean, it's worthwhile having in the market. It's just that at the moment, in terms of where it's, it suits for the best performance versus the money you're going to spend, is in not so ideal rooms. That's, that's where DLP really performs. It, anywhere else, um, it's going to struggle. And when it comes to HDR, do you really need it on a projector? Is what I was going to say. Because so far, I don't feel I'm really missing out that much. And of course, you're getting players like the Oppo and, and Panasonic to a certain extent do let you have control over, uh, certainly the Oppo lets you have control over the metadata. Um, so you, you can switch it off if you want um, with a projector. You can even uh, say what the peak brightness of your display is. So with a projector, yeah. you're lucky if you're going to get 120 nits out of it. So, but you can set the player to do that and then it'll tone map it that way. So, so there are solutions there for projector users. And HDR's never going to be a big thing on a projector, just with the technology that you're talking about. And the only way you, you're going to get the absolute best is to have a dedicated room uh, where you have absolute light control and you can get the black level and shadow retrieval that HDR allows you to have. I'd love to see a projector with Dolby Vision uh, on it or some form of dynamic metadata because that way it could be adjusted from scene to scene. It would definitely help projectors yeah. in that sense. Yeah, that, that, I, I want to see that as well because I think that's that's where you, it's going to be a game changer, that kind of technology. I mean, that's where Dolby Vision really helps. That's why LG immediately went Dolby Vision because of OLED yeah. and and the reduced uh, nits values on, on the OLEDs, but they can get the best out of the content by using Dolby Vision. It'll be interesting to see HDR10+. plus. We'll get to see that at CES. I have no doubt there will be material for us to look at that, that's been done by studios and so on. There'll be demos running. I'm sure we'll get to see plenty of that, and it'll be interesting to see how well that works as well. But for a projector, that technology absolutely will make a, a difference. I, I'm quite convinced of that. Anyway, we're going to move on. We're going to change tack completely. Like I say, we're going to put our smoking jackets on, put the slippers on, get the pipe out. We're heading to hi-fi zone with Ed, and we're talking about some really lovely 1970s style speakers, Ed. The important word in that is style, because, <laughs> um, yes, I'm actually doing no less than three stand mount pairs of speakers for the next clutch of reviews and a pair of subwoofers. So it's all been quite speakery this month. Um, 
and I wanted to talk about the the one that actually only turned up uh, yesterday. They've done very little here thus far, not least because they're quite difficult to move around on one leg. I won't I won't lie. Um, but yes, this is the uh, Tannoy Legacy uh, Eaton. I need to make sure I get the right ones on this. It's the smallest member, although I need to cover that all things are relative when talking about small here, of uh, a range of speakers where Tannoy has essentially uh, looked at, or well, they reinvigorated a range of speakers that they made in the 1970s. Phil's completely correct on this. Uh, there, there were some more back in the 70s. They've just gone for edited highlights this time. Uh, what they've done is they've gone through it and they've used some of their more modern technology where applicable, where relevant. But the end result, I don't really want to spoil the um, thing because I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to, to take some properly good photos of these. And um, yes, it, it's just extraordinary. If you encountered them in cash converters, you would assume that they were house clearance from a deceased relative. But <laughs> um, they're fabulous. Uh, they're, they're really, really very good indeed. Um, it's a completely different take to how we associate speakers being in this day and age. They are wide across the front and comparatively shallow. Uh, they use a 10 inch driver, which let's face it, we, we, we look at subwoofers. The, actually, I have looked at subwoofers this month, which use a smaller driver than that. Um, so it's a totally different way of going about producing audio. But uh, it has to be said that it, you know, even in the, its very early stage, it's quite clear that we didn't stop doing this because it didn't work properly. We sort of moved to the more modern shape we associate with loudspeakers because it's just more convenient. It's more domestically acceptable. Um, this is a very, you know, it, it might look like a historical curio, but it's it's a very, very serious loudspeaker indeed. And it's quite interesting because this is going to be one of the, the three speakers. It's the most expensive of the three. Um, but we've also got an exclusive look at um, a new loudspeaker from Spender. Now, I looked at a Spender loudspeaker, I think, last year, the S35. Um, and bizarrely, Spender has actually taken some of the technology for that and worked it into their what's supposed to be their modern range of loudspeakers, the A series. So that's got quite an interesting one. And then because not everything I've looked at is from the 1970s, there is also towards the end of the month, there will be a look at the brand new KEF Q350 as well, um, which is bang up to date, incredibly modern and looks totally incongruous compared to these other loudspeakers. But it's been interesting to have all these three, these three stand mounts coming through pretty much sequentially because one, um, the level of performance that is on offer from them uh, at their various price points is deeply impressive. And um, it just shows that there, there really are, there really is more than one way to skin a cat when it comes to loudspeakers. We've got ported stand mount, steel box stand mount, gigantic stand mount, um, different driver materials. And it's it's been great fun. And uh, hopefully I can try and make sense of it all when I turn it into copy. Why do I think of Jimmy Neal when you say Spender? Uh, because he was, he was, you know, he was the, the Britain's most famous Sierra Cosworth user. But um, <laughs> this is S P E N D O R uh, rather than E R, um, so Ooh. not not quite the same, I'm afraid. But no, um, interestingly, uh, <laughs> I suppose this is a good anecdote. When um, we, when we sort of lined up the Eaton review for, for Tannoy. Actually, Tannoy approached us first and asked, did we want to do its big brother, the Arden? Um, <laughs> it's like, I had to sort of point out that they are, the Arden is, is uses a 15 inch base driver and it's 66 centimeters wide. Um, <laughs> and I had to point out to the, the very lovely lady at Tannoy that one, I can't walk at the moment. So that really, that's a bit of a challenge. And even if I could, I physically don't think they will fit in the space that I review loudspeakers in. <laughs> so, um, we might have to revisit that when, uh, when Steve's up for it, I guess, you know, that a nice, a nice 1970s speaker. I, Steve, I don't, you... I don't think Steve has the room for that either. <laughs> yeah. I don't think I've got the room for it. <laughs> Oh well, we'll have to find we'll have to find ways and means of looking at the giant one at some point. But this is yeah. You bear in mind that the, as I say, ten inch driver. This is Tannoy's smallest offering in the legacy range. <laughs> um, you know they really are. Yes. Uh, sorry, a quick question. I was looking at the pictures of the Eaton. Yes. Are there little plugs on the front? Ah yes. 
Yes, because back in ah, well, you remember back in the seventies, you know, we were allowed to adjust the sound to suit, you know, your own preferences in your room. Yes, you can dial in um, different different cut and boost on the on the treble and just alter the behaviour of the dual concentric driver, uh, which I will be covering in lavish and probably unnecessarily <laughs> complex detail. But yes, it is it, it, as I say when they say legacy, this genuinely does all the things that the original one does and you know i am as much as guilty as any as m- many other people active in this industry of being very dismissive of tone controls and eqing and things like that i you know it's early days yet i haven't done very much playing with that but i have an annoying suspicion that i'm probably going to see some considerable merit in it by the time that i'm done so well, I, the thing the thing the yeah, other I mean, have you got an extender that you can use? Because you're going to have to get up and walk across and adjust and then go back and sit down and listen and then go back <laughs> up and adjust. That's going to take you weeks to do that. No, 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 no. I've got it all worked, sussed out. I've got this piano stool, one of my one of my wife's piano stools in the lounge at the moment. And what happens is when I need to stand up, I kick the piano stool over towards the rack and then I just sort of bounce over and then I can sit and adjust things on the rack before repeating it in the other direction. It's It's not what I'd call slick. But it is reasonably, reasonably uh, quick. I think we need a YouTube video of this. I think you can sod off. <laughs> I, I think you should get those things that the guys use in parks to pick up litter. And then you could just. That, that's that's, that that's what I was getting at. Yeah, you'd, you'd have to. To have be slenders. honest, to be honest, I have to say I'm going to be reluctant to com- to get rid of both crutches come next week because, um, for long and complicated reasons, my amp it's got remote uh volume and balance but it doesn't have remote input selection i've just got so used to just prodding the front of it with a crutch um i've got a question yes um so if you had a lin turntable yes and these eaton speakers what amp would you get for the full 70s experience well you've got some various options um you could go with uh quads uh classics although they actually technically date back to the sort of 50s 60s for for true 70s you would possibly want to look at the magnificently named sugden a21 from (laughs) heckman dwight in yorkshire they've been updating it but it's still broadly speaking an amp which has been in production for, for for many decades or if you want to go all in they are technically new designs but if you take a look at them you'll realize that new again is a relative term one of the big Luxman or Accuphase integrated amps, which have got a socking great pair of VU meters on the front. And in the case of the Accuphase, has especially come in proper Japanese high-end gold. <laughs> um, so, yeah. Uh, I mean, the thing is that unlike uh, AV, as Phil consistently points out, we, you know, we, of course, there's been enormous technical progress, but... When you look at very high-end designs from, you know, the 70s onwards, a lot of it, it's more a case that it no, a hi-fi no longer looks like that because we we want it to be smaller, we want it to be more convenient, uh, we want it to be perhaps slightly less fussed about where you, you place it and things like that. There is, this isn't needless nostalgia. Essentially, the market thankfully stereos come back from its very low point and there's enough scope and enough demand in the market tannoy produces plenty of normal looking loudspeakers so does spender and so on and so forth this gives you an option to to just try something different and it must be said depending on the decor that you have in your house if you are an old furniture person you've got some you know really nice antique furniture in some ways the Eaton is going to look much happier in your lounge than a, a socking great pair of you know Bose and Wilkins or you know somebody else that does sort of bleeding edge modern there is a method in the manner I think Tannoy have been quite clever with this one I managed to bite my tongue when you said the phrase smallest member <laughs> <laughs> Right, I think we need to move on before this descends into silliness. Uh, and before we wrap up on hardware, because you're not around next week, Ed, and, and we'll all be praying for your operation and that you come through it unscathed and, and they've got a Phillips screwdriver to remove the screws. We Is it flathead, is it? Oh, well, you should be all right. You can use a knife for that. Um, <laughs> you've got final release and play, playlist of the month, Ed, and, of course, your album of the month. Yes, right. Album of the month is first. Um, I think I've mentioned this guy before, uh, but there is a singer-songwriter. He's called, well, he performs under the name Fink, 
F-I-N-K. Uh, he's been active for over a decade now on the Ninja Tune label, and his latest album, Resurgam, is was released very, very recently. And this is my general album of the month because it's a lovely, lovely recording, and it's a, it's you know it's a, and a very, very good piece of music as well. I need to stress that. Um, the other thing is that uh, Ninja Tune, as a label, I think for, really deserve. Um, some credit and recognition for what they do because if you you can obviously buy it on Amazon on iTunes all the rest of it if you go to the Ninja Tune website though you can buy the album directly uh, there is a vinyl release a CD release an mp3 release and a WAV lossless release uh, shipping is free I think it's all very fairly priced for what it is and it's it allow it you know you know that the artist is going to get something he's going to get royalties out of that it's completely slick and easy to use so there's lots and lots of different ways of, of listening to the album it's on all the major streaming services as well um i'm you know i had a quick listen yesterday i'm gonna have a, a, another listen after after this podcast is over and i <clears throat> I, I think it's it, it's something that's it's well worth a go and if you know by all means you know use it as a jumping off point to some of his back catalog because fink's uh arc as a performer is very interesting because he signed to ninja tune as a techno dj and his first album is techno he then took 18 months off and returned playing a guitar but there's just enough sensibility as to timing use of electronics where necessary and so on and so forth it's a unique sound and it's it's one that i'm a huge fan of if anyone that reads my reviews you'll know that i've, I've been referencing in, in all sorts of stuff for years it's a really really good album and i would urge you to check it out vinyl release as ever i try and pick something on vinyl where there is a benefit to having it on vinyl um and for this month that means that we look towards a uh in your i sense eye rolling when i say this because you always accuse me of making these things up and i'm not this is a french canadian band called death from above 1979 i'm uh, sorry this this is all sounding like sugar ape magazine to me <laughs> You can have a look on Amazon. It's there. The album is called Outrage Is Now. Um, basically, it's like Royal Blood, but a bit more electronic. It's it's loud. It's shouty. It's music to to fight wars to, basically. But the vinyl release is an altogether slightly more forgiving proposition than the digital. So if you were interested in buying it, um, that would be my v vinyl would probably be my format of choice for this one. It just sounds a little bit smooth, a little bit more forgiving. But it's a damn good listen. A lot of fun. Um, true story. One of the ladies who works at my son's nursery, um, she all through the summer, she had like long sleeves on and, you know, even when it was quite hot. And I assumed it might be because she you know, had eczema or something like that. But I saw her coming in for work one morning and she's got a gigantic death from above 1979 forearm sleeve tattoo, uh, <laughs> which I thought was amazing. Um, Is that so. more socially acceptable than eczema? Uh, I I would say so. I personally would have no problem with her having that uncovered. But you know, uh, obviously, I perhaps am a slightly different. I take a slightly different <laughs> than some other parents. But that would be my vinyl release of the month. Uh, playlists. It's been a very poor month across all of the streaming services that I follow for playlists. So there hasn't been a true standout for me. Um, Th this month the, the blips and blops one that phil and i reference from time to time that was that came out a couple of days ago and it's not a bad listen um and i would also direct people there on tidal there is a uh a, a, a twin peaks based soundtrack which takes some of the some of the sort of incidental music used from the from the this just recently done version and then some of the the music that was played in the bar slash pub or whatever the thing that, that's central to central to the plot thing there's actually there's actually that was quite a good listen i had that on yesterday but i am afraid nothing this month has really blown my frock up playlist wise so streaming services sort your sort your act out Okay, so uh, that's Ed's album vinyl and playlist of the month. And coming up next is movie news. Okay, so uh, moving on to movie news and uh, movie reviews. 
uh, we managed to get to the cinema again this week. So that's a, that's a limitless card paid for. Uh, well, it was paid for last week when I saw Logan Lucky and um, American Assassin. Uh, so this week I wasn't that bothered because it didn't cost me anything to go and see Kingsman, the Golden Circle. Um, Kazi's review came in the, the day before I went to see it and the day before you went to see it, Steve. And uh, not very promising <laughs> um, reading Kazi's review. Uh, so I went in with probably lower expectations than I would have uh, to start with, because I really enjoyed the first film, even though it was utterly stupid. Um, I really did enjoy it. So I went in with low expectations, and actually I came out of this one probably liking it quite a bit more than Kaz uh, did. I would score it a 7 out of 10, uh, because there are issues with this film. The, the issues that I don't have with the film is that it's absolutely bonkers stupid, because the first one was. It's not set in any kind of reality whatsoever, so you just accept that, because the first one was like that. It wasn't set in any kind of reality. It, it has its own universe that it's set within, where things are just absolutely stupid. There are plot holes the size of Saturn here, but if that's your thing and you want to go looking for plot holes, this is not the film for you, because it is stupid. It is overly, overly big and over the top and bonkers rubbish. You could call it whatever you like. It, it's just stupid, basically. It's silly. Yet, I found it really quite entertaining. The thing is, it's overly long. Um, I think the the fact that there was more money to spend this time around, it's a shame they didn't spend it on better CGI in the first sort of few minutes of the film. And, and this film gets going straight away. So, within the first 30 seconds, you're into a car chase through London. It's straight on it. But during that car chase, it was so obvious. The CGI stuff... Um, speeded up film, that kind of thing. But again, it's over the top, it's stupid. So I think you need to go into this one with, with the right frame of mind, Steve. Um, hopefully you'll agree with me on this one because if you're going in and, 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 and I guess this is where when you go in with a critical mind, um, you maybe read, read into things a little bit too much rather than just sitting, you know, parking the brain at the front door and just going in and letting it wash over you, which he's got, you've got to do with this film. So it has its real plus points. The plus points are I saw it with a full cinema. It was absolutely packed out. And there was laughing, there was cheering, there was audience participation where, where there should be. And that adds to the experience of seeing the film. That will add some bias to your opinion, I, I suppose, in, in one or two ways. But that was enjoyable because where, where the jokes fell right, and there are some really, really funny jokes in this, This it's outrageous in terms of what it does. I mean, there is one scene where, uh, I'm not going to spoil it, but he has to put something on his finger and then insert his finger somewhere, which it is what it sounds like when I describe it that way. And <laughs> it's so over the top. And then you got to realise that it was actually a, a woman that wrote this, uh, which Steve pointed out to me this morning. Um, and that's a type of humour level. It, 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 there's smut in here, basically. Um, there's toilet humour. There's it's it's at that level. If you let it wash over you, you, and and you're not too critical, and you're not looking for the massive, and I mean absolutely massive plot holes, the fact that the villain is just comedic villain, completely over the top, which was the same with Samuel L. in in the original film. You know, it it was just stupid. It it was based on some kind of character. Ch- caricature of, of, of somebody that exists but taken to the nth degree and I'm sure yeah, some of that... In the first film it was basically Steve Jobs. Wasn't it? it was, Steve yeah. Steve Jobs was yeah. black and had a lisp. Yeah, then that would totally. Be, that would totally. Be that. And this one it's basically Martha Stewart isn't it? She's exactly. It is, yeah, it is. It's exactly. <laughs> and, and there's great little references in there. There's lots of little Easter eggs if you pick up on them or not. But I can see why there are the, the one out of five reviews that are out there because I think film critics will take it a certain way. The, the, the thing is that that audience I saw it with last night enjoyed it. You could tell that because they were laughing along. They were sniggering where, where, where they were supposed to. The, you could tell everybody was tensing up in the action sequences and so on. But it's not perfect. It's far from perfect. It is stupid. There's a cameo in there that they overdo. It was funny the first couple of times that this cameo appears on screen. The fourth and fifth and sixth times that he turned oh, up. Although I did enjoy the joke right at the very end with the, if you say the world, you can have a backstage pass. Was Ex- yeah, well, that I was... got a massive laugh. <laughs> they got a massive laugh, yeah. And obviously that was harking back to the first film as well. Yeah. Um, and obviously she's in it as well. So Princess T is in it and, and the, the way they've de- developed her character... It's quite funny as well. However, don't go into this thinking there's going to be a lot of character development um, or it makes much sense, because it doesn't. Um, like I say, the plot holes are massive. The The plot is just ludicrous, stupid. Although an interesting critique of, of the of the policy on drugs, I thought, actually, they made some really, in amongst all the pure art humour and silly action scenes, they made quite a valid point. 
about the war on drugs and how it's utterly failed. Yeah. Uh, and the fact that things like cigarettes and alcohol are legal and far more dangerous to most people. And uh, well, yeah, I, I thought the inter- there was an interesting message in there in amongst all the puerile humour that actually um, yeah. was, was quite valid. No, yeah, I, I agree with that one. But what I'm saying is don't go into this expecting any uh, super plot. It, it doesn't exist. There isn't any plot in here. Like I say, yeah. this this is just one big, dumb, fun movie that's played for laughs throughout. Think of um, the Mike Myers, uh, Austin Powers type spoofing of spies and then turn it up to 100. It's very much like um, the original movie, but they've got more money. Um, they found the volume dial for the soundtrack and turned it up to 11. Um, it, sometimes it just got really infuriatingly loud for no apparent reason whatsoever. Whatever the soundtrack was that was playing while they were fighting, it just got louder and louder and louder. Um, but I, I guess they were playing the old get you on the edge of the seat, you know, um, play with you with, with the sound design, which they did quite a bit with this. Um, so yeah, six and a half, seven out of ten for me. I, see it with an audience, it's enjoyable. Just leave your, your brain at the, the front door and, and don't think too much about it, which the next film that Steve's going to talk about is, is a thinker. Yeah. <laughs> Obviously, I saw two films last night. One was The Golden Circle in a packed cinema, like you, Phil, and everyone loved it with cheering and laughing. Um, and I also saw Mother um, before that in a uh, not so packed cinema. I think there were three of us in there. <laughs> and uh, what a strange film. What a strange <laughs> film. Um, I think I understand it. I actually, when I got back, I had to quickly read a few things to see what the director had to say. But I thought, okay, yeah, I did interpret it correctly. But uh, yeah, it's it's a very, very strange film. Um, a lot of it feels like you're watching a waking dream. Uh, and in fact, bizarrely, there's a couple of scenes in it. There's, there's, a, there's a bit where, um, so it takes place within, within a house and there's a wife and a, and a, and a husband. And then a, a guy turns up, Ed Harris basically turns up and, and he invites him in. And then he says, well, you can stay if you want. And then more people keep turning up. And basically, her house is full of all these people who won't go away. And I thought, I've had that dream when I'm in, a, in my home. It's never actually my real home, but, you know, a dream home. And there are people there. And I was like, will you just all get out? <laughs> and also, there's a bit where she finds a, a, a room, effectively, that she didn't know was there within the house. And again, I've had that dream, too. So there's a real dream um, structure to it, which, which I thought worked really well. But then later on in the film, it, 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 other things start happening and you realize, what he's trying to say um or i think hopefully you realize what he's trying to say but it, it, it is a long strange trip and uh, uh sharuna's comments in her review about it feel like a trip to the dentist where you know you're you're nervous and, and, and before the visit you know it's an uncomfortable experience and then you're just relieved when it's over is kind of how that film is so it might seem like a strange thing to say but it is it is an uncomfortable experience that you're generally relieved when it's over but having said all that i was thinking about it a lot afterwards um when I went in, obviously I wasn't thinking about the golden circle. It's just like having a Big Mac. You eat it, and then after the film's finished, you forget about it. But whereas this did stay with me, and I did find myself thinking about it a lot afterwards and thinking about it in bed at night and um, still thinking about it this morning. So uh, it, it certainly had an impact, um, but I would no, in no way would say this is an enjoyable experience or a film that is clearly not... I mean, it was being marketed as a horror movie, and that was such a bad mistake. They should have marketed this. They should have started this film off small, low-key, lots of, lots of critic screenings, small art house cinemas and then gone wider but going wide particularly in the states on the back of um advertising campaign that was i think attached to it saying you know if you, if you think that's scary you should go and see this it's not a horror film and there are unnerving moments here and there are scares in it too but it, it's so not a horror movie and it's so that's so targeting it to the wrong audience uh, the performances are all really good uh jennifer lawrence who you know carries the entire film is on screen almost constantly uh delivers a great performance but it, it is a deeply disturbing and strange film um and uh, yeah, you will, but but uh, at the same time, it will make you think, and you will it will stay with you long afterwards. Okay, I, I, I've I got no idea what to score it though. <laughs> it could be <laughs> well, you, did, mean, it, you didn't give us a your Kingsman score. So what was? Your oh Kingsman? yeah, Kingsman. Well, Kingsman. I mean, like you, Philip, because I went in with low expectations. Um, uh, and, you know, and I obviously was expecting a masterpiece from Kingsman, The Golden Circle. I thoroughly enjoyed it, and I think a seven out of ten would be right. Uh, I think basically it just needed to be. It needed a bit of editing. It was way too long. And, and unfortunately, they fell into the trap of you know thinking that more is better in sequels, yeah. and that's not always the case. But having said all that, uh, like you say, it, it's just a silly film. It's not like Kingsman was a masterpiece. You know that was stupid as well. So I, I actually found myself quite enjoying it. And uh, the two, I mean, even though it was a little bit too long, but um, it probably was a nice antidote to the two hours of Mother to go and just do <laughs> something really, you know, really turn my brain off, sit back and just enjoy the enjoy the the, the ride. So. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, I, I give seven out of ten to uh, Kingsman. Uh, Mother is either a one or a ten. <laughs> I'm really not quite sure which. <laughs> okay, we'll leave it at that. I'd, interestingly, my Fitbit thought I was sleeping um, between seven p.m. and nine forty-five p.m. last night, which is the exact uh, time I was sat, <laughs> sat watching Kingsman. No, I was wide awake, but obviously. The, the Fitbit I thought I'd gone to sleep. <laughs> so there you go. Uh, right, so films opening this Friday. Uh, anything in there worth going to see? I see there's a 1980s remake. Uh, 1990, actually. But, uh, was yeah, it, was it 90, was it? All right, 1990, okay. yeah. Flatliners. A, a film I remember going to see in 1990. And um, I can't say that it was one that was screaming out to be remade. I think everyone thought it was stupid back in 1990. But at least it had a cast that included Kevin Bacon, Julia Roberts and... Uh, and uh, Kiefer Sutherland, I mean, this new one, there's a remade Flatliners. If you, have, if you know what it's about, it's basically a bunch of stu- medical students who deliberately kill one another in order to experience the afterlife. And then obviously nasty things follow them back. Um, it was silly then. It's still silly now. Uh, I, gu- I guess it's just another indicative of the fact there's a complete lack of imagination in Hollywood anymore. And they just can't think of anything new to do. So they're just remaking old stuff. Um, this one's headlined by Ellen Page. It's got Diego Luna in it as well. Um, I've seen the trailer. It looks like a shot for shot remake of the original. So um, I guess if, if you're into that kind of thing, feel free to go and see it. Otherwise, just, you know, rent or watch the flatliners. I'm sure it'll be on Netflix or one of the streaming services to tie in with this. Just watch the original. But uh, I can't say it's something I, I'd be interested in seeing. Uh, also coming out uh, this week, there is The Exception, which is a World War II movie, which actually does sound quite interesting. Shruna has already seen it at a press screening. So that review will be up early next week. Uh, well, this week, and if you're listening, it's on Monday. And uh, uh, and that looks interesting. It's, it's a World War II movie. It's, it involves the Kaiser. So, the, I mean, Ed can probably fill me in more, fill us in here. But uh, the deposed Kaiser after the Nazis took over is in, is in um, exile, I think, in Denmark. And it involves Netherlands. a plot. Netherlands, thank you. A uh, plot to kill him. Um, so that sounds interesting. And also, there's, there's a mockumentary called Pecking Order about people raising chickens, which is a New Zealand movie that actually apparently is really funny. Uh, Shuna said she thought it was excellent. So uh, if you fancy a laugh, might be worth checking that out. Okay. Uh, Blu-rays. What can we go out and buy if it's not available on 4K? Uh, well, um, <laughs> if, if you're not looking for anything too highbrow this week, you're in luck. Uh, we've got Baywatch, which comes out on Blu-ray and Ultra HD Blu-ray this week. Uh, and I've got to say... I, I, I'm ashamed to a bit. I did quite enjoy the film at the cinema. Uh, you saw it as well, didn't you, Phil? Uh, no, in the end, I didn't oh, bother. Didn't go. Um, it's yeah. It's you know, it doesn't take itself seriously. It, it, it's it, in no way you know. It, it, when you're making a film version of the TV series Baywatch, come on, there's no point trying to even be meant to to be serious. So it's always got its tongue firmly in its cheek. Uh, and uh, and actually, yeah, that's not the only funny. cheek on vis- yeah, visible. Yeah, there's plenty either. of cheeks on, on display. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, it, yeah, yes, it doesn't take itself seriously. It is what it is, uh, and actually, I, I found I think uh, the review was done by Simon, who was in the same boat. You know, he, said he didn't, he didn't expect to enjoy it, but was ashamed to say he actually found it quite funny. So that's coming out, and actually, as, a, as an ultra-rated Blu-ray, it's not bad. Got Dolby Atmos soundtrack. Um, you know, there's um, some quite nice use of HDR because obviously it's lots of brightly sunlit beaches. Um, so worth checking out for that. We've also got King Arthur. What's, a, what's, a, what's a skin tones like, Steve? Flesh tones are excellent. Apart from the rock, obviously he's very ton- very toned and and bronzed and slightly gleaming. And actually, I'll tell you what: with HDR, the sheen of the uh, <laughs> the sheen of sweat on on the rock's forehead is is very very visible. It's oh God! Just... <laughs> In that pause button again, Steve. Oh. <laughs> Do you have a slow mo function? <laughs> it, it won't be as good as the old laser disc carved it. Oh, let's not go there. At least, at least, uh, at least, I was talking about his actual head and not anything else. Um, right, King Arthur, Legend <laughs> of the Sword. Make it any better. <laughs> <laughs> King Arthur, Legend of the Sword is Guy Ritchie's take on a legend, the Arthurian legend. Um, basically, it's uh, Arthur this, meets. Um, this is the one where David Beckham has a star role in it, then. Yeah, yeah. Well, he's, not, he's got a very short. He appears briefly. It's basically lock, stock, and two smoking Excaliburs. Um, and uh, whoever thought that was a good idea, I don't know. <laughs> I know a, n- a number of listeners appreciate my wife's periodic take on yeah, a number. She, she had to see it because there was nothing else on. And uh, her her comeback review was absolute shit. So, um... <laughs> yeah, it was crap. I've, I've, I've got the disc. And uh, um, whilst it is a very nice old trash team Blu-ray, the film is cobbler's. It's just, you I just... thought you had stopped buying things just because yeah. they were on Ultra HD Blu-ray. I stopped that? buying everything because it's on Ultra HD <laughs> The odd turkey still sneaks through, uh, and this is definitely one. Uh, uh, it's just like you kind of think, why did they bother? 
what was the point? Um, you know, if you want to watch an Arthurian film, but you know, go and watch Le- Excalibur. Excalibur does it brilliantly. This is just uh, silly. Uh, and it's also, you know, it's Charlie Hunnam set up in bloke, no delivery as well. Yeah, well, actually, Charlie Hunnam uh, isn't always bad. I've seen him. Well, as no, no, he was he good. was excellent in Sons of Anarchy. Yes. Um, but then appears to just be squandering that goodwill. It's like mm, Pacific Rim. That sounds excellent. Where do I where do I, I sign? I like Pacific. Rim. I like Pacific Rim too. But let's be completely <laughs> honest. All of the people, with the possible exception of Idris Elba, are just you know they're just ob- you know small objects that you know that uh, uh, allow for the uh, just the the tackiest of paste to stick the robot sequences together i mean i'm looking forward to the sequel even though i know that that will almost certainly be terrible yeah, and also does try to make i'm also worried that it won't table. have guillermo del toro's attention to detail because that's what made the first one that's what allowed it to just get away with being pretty much dross so I'm, um, but I digress. I, uh, anyway, that's... your wife's review of of, of um, King Arthur is spot on. So yes, yeah. I'm <laughs> a, a, a Richie completist. <laughs> am I right in thinking that there was a King Arthur film not that long ago in in the last sort of decade as well? Yeah, had Keira Knightley and Clive Owen. Yeah. Oh yeah, because you know, he's that my problem. absolute go to for for uh, Arthurian legend, Clive Owen. He just has a majesty to. Oh no, wait, he doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to watch a King Arthur movie, John John Borman did it in eighty uh, two um, with Excalibur. Just go and see, or eighty three, I think it was. Yeah. Go and see Excalibur. It's the, absolutely the, fantastic. The West Country accents just make it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Which is, by the way, historically well, not that he existed, but if he did exist, he would have a West Country accent or even a Cornish accent, isn't he? Born in, could be born in Cornwall. Uh, anyway, um, yeah. So that's coming out. Also coming out this week on on Blu Ray, we have the seventh season of The Walking Dead. Um, if you're going to watch it, skip the first six and watch the last six because uh, it, it's it's a very frustrating season. Um, but it does set up things nicely for season eight, which should which should be more fun with uh, all out war. Um, but the, f- the seventh season definitely was uh, the first half of the seventh season that I took. A, I almost gave up watching. I thought, I don't know if I can be bothered with this anymore. So but it picks up in the second half. And also we mentioned it at the beginning in the, in the competition prizes. I'll be Lethal Weapon season one is also out on Blu-ray this week and is apparently very good. I know I use the word apparently then. But I haven't seen it, so I can't comment personally. Yeah. So uh, UHD Blu-ray stuff. So Steve, I've been I've been buying some UHD Blu-rays recently. Um, you'll be mm. you'll be happy to know. So there was the ones I mentioned last week. I, I sat down and watched Blade Runner the other night. So I watched a little bit on the Samsung TV that I've got here for testing stuff at the minute. So I watched a little bit in HDR, and then I moved over to the projector and watched it in scope on a ten foot scope screen, and it looked stunning it is absolutely beautiful um the soundtrack is amazing there are issues with adr it is a film from the 80s the recording techniques were not great back then and uh what you don't want them to do is, is redo stuff now because then you're changing uh stuff you know music cues and that kind of thing that you don't want to be changing you don't want to be changing dialogue input so there's a few bits with adr sounds a little bit odd a little bit boxy but in terms of the atmos stunning Absolutely stunning, and in terms of the image, Steve, and this is going to bring us on to something that has been uh, being discussed. In I've seen some really odd reviews with it being discussed, and it has been discussed on the forums as well. And that that is, you know, what constitutes a film like Image. A lot of people complaining about grain. You know, these films were shot. Well, Blade Runner was shot on t- on two film stocks. It was sixty five mil and um, the effect sequences, yeah. for for effect sequences and so on. It was also other bits were shot thirty five mil. Um, different types of film stock as well, so it wasn't all the same. The grain changes throughout the film. Sometimes it's really quite intense uh, because there's cheap stocks used uh, to give it a certain gritty feel. And then you've got the 65 mil stuff, which looks a bit cleaner uh, because obviously it's a larger format, um, so there's more detail in there anyway um, and and less grain. Uh, so so there is inconsistencies when you when you watch the whole f- film right the way through in terms of the grain because. In terms of lighting as well, because a lot of it is used artificial lighting. There's there's no daylight whatsoever in this film. It's all artificial lighting. Um, it's all beautifully, beautifully put together. I mean, it's so artistic. You just it's dripping in talent when you look at each scene. When you look at each scene and the way it's composed, you know Ridley Scott was a genius back then. Absolutely. You look at Alien. Alien is exactly the same. The way uh, you know the the cinematography is composed. The, the way it's put together, the way the lighting 
techniques are used and that kind of thing and that that plays throughout so when you're talking about artificial lighting and so on that again you're underexposing or overexposing sometimes with film and and grain's an issue grain exists in film it's what gives film its look so i can understand that people who you know generations where they have been brought up on digital looking film and that kind of thing where films look clean and tv dramas where you know you're not getting green because it's not shoot shot on film anymore and that kind of thing i can understand that it will look odd to people and they'll think that it's noise and so on there is no noise in blade runner whatsoever there's no compression issues in there there's no video noise whatsoever in there it is it is green the other thing is the matte paintings i don't know if you noticed it steve but at the start when they're heading towards Tyrell Corporation. It's the first time I've noticed the matte painting. Um, you mean the clouds in the background? No, the actual buildings. And it um, is it's the it's the really wide shot. You know when when they're quite a distance away from the from the yeah. The, there's, there's a there's a foreground miniature in there, and then the background yeah. is basically a big matte painting. But well, actually, it yeah. might not be a matte painting. It might actually just be a painting. Yeah. <laughs> Rather than yeah. a matte painting, actually, and, in the back of the model. And you can really notice it, and you got, and and at the time, you know, the, this would have been shown in the cinemas. You wouldn't have noticed. As, as much because it, you wouldn't have had as, as crisp a, a, and detailed an image. So yes, again, I can understand why people on the forums are bringing that up and, and maybe... But I've read some reviews that say, oh, it's full of noise and it's added video noise and all this. It's rubbish. Absolute rubbish. It's it's how it's supposed to look. And the same will be true of Close Encounters. I haven't seen Close Encounters yeah, yet. Exactly but, the same. But again, it was, it was shot um, in exactly the same way. There'll be grain in there. And films from that year, I mean, um, Jaws was the same when it came out on Blu-ray. I mean, there was there was a few scenes where it was really, really noticeable. But that, that's when that's... You the conditions Jaws was shot under. It exactly. It was. Exactly. But it's supposed to be there, people. And, you know, I would rather see that than them trying to do what they did with Predator a little while back. Where well, they, yeah, quite. They, they tried to clean it all up, and then it, things just look like plaster scene. You know, it's... Uh, and, and and it ruins because it's actually taking detail out. I mean, the grain has to exist for the detail to exist. Um, and again, Blade Runner, there's a, there's a few bits people were saying it's soft. Yeah, there was. There was a few bits where it looks soft. It's artistic intent. They're it's shooting it on anamorphic lenses too, <laughs> aren't they? So you're going to yeah. get soft bits at the edges yeah. of the frame with the lens. I mean, these are old. We're talking about 35 years ago. Lenses weren't as good. Yeah. <laughs> they, 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 yeah. they, they, the lenses would have had, had aberrations, anamorphic lenses particularly. Um, as you say, there's going to be film grain because it's a photochemical process. It's just a natural part of film shot on 35 mil. The effects exists were done on 65 mil. Douglas Trumbull did the effects. The same, exactly the same with Close Encounters because he did the effects for that too. So the film was shot on 35 mil, but the effects were done with 65 mil. Um, so you're going to get differences there, of course. But the reason they were shooting on 65 mil with the effects is when they optically composite them down, you don't lose uh, quality. Yeah. And that's why they were doing that. Yeah. Uh, I, I just think that... Um, that this this version of Blade Runner is, is quite simply. There were moments where I watched watching it, particularly watching it on the B7, uh, in you know in HDR with those with those black levels. It was like watching the film for the first time. Uh, some there was I've seen this film more times than it's healthy, uh, and the, I was I was seeing stuff I'd never seen before. I thought, oh, Christ, look at that, look at that. It's absolutely stunning. Yes, of course, there's film grain, and that's meant to be. And I'm, I'm amazed at the level of ignorance of people that are supposed to be professional reviewers who don't understand this and understand the nature of film and what it is. The most beautiful film-like image I've seen on Ultra HD Blu-ray so far. It's the best Blade Runner has ever looked, and I guess ever will look. Um, and I think it's absolutely amazing. And as you say, the, the soundtrack is just the cherry on the cake. The soundtrack on this film is stunning. The, the bass notes in the opening credit sequence just rock the room. And then you've got spinners flying over your heads and this sort of stuff. It's absolutely stunning. My only complaint with the film, and it's something that I was just going to mention because um, it comes out this week as a special edition, is that the first release a couple of weeks ago was a two-disc release. So it was just the, the, the final cut, Ultra HD Blu-ray, and the same thing on Blu-ray. And annoyingly, they didn't do a new Blu-ray. It's just a Blu-ray from the release from 10 years ago, um, which is, I think is a bit um, shoddy of them. But there was no e other extras included, but the US release included the Dangerous Days um, documentary, although annoyingly, um, that's still on a DVD and not on a Blu-ray, even though the documentary was shot on, on, in uh, HD and also included three other versions of the film. But it didn't include the uh, work print that was included in the five-disc set for release, released um, 10 years ago. Um, the new release version coming out in the UK this week is basically the same, a mirror image of the American one, but with an additional booklet. And there'll also be a, 
a sta- um, there'll be a steelbook version coming out too. I've got, I've got to say the collector's edition at thirty five quid in HMV. It looked like decent quality, to be honest. It looked like it was worth the if you haven't already got. If you don't yeah. already have the five yeah. disc set, yeah. but, um, but we we already have that, so I'm quite happy with just the, the, the you know the the standard 4K Blu-ray. I'm, I was quite happy with that. Um, but yes, if you don't already have the five disc set and all the rest of it, then it's it's, it's 35 quid. It's worth picking it up, I think. Yeah, I, I just think that there was an opportunity here to do a, a, a new because obviously it was 10 years ago that five disc set, so that's quite a long time, particularly in terms of image quality. 2007, they'd only been around for a year, Blu-ray, haven't it? So yeah, you got you got to remember though um, with Blade Runner the rights holders and the, the the amount of hassle there was even getting it onto Blu-ray um, all those years back. I don't know if you remember the controversy that went on there. Yeah, luckily um, <laughs> the guys are dead now, <laughs> so less of an issue, I think. But no, I just think they could have done they could have done a, 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 a new a new five disc set with with the uh, with the Ultra HD Blu-ray version of the final cut and also the other versions. Um, they could have done that if they wanted to. They didn't, and I would have liked to have seen them do Dangerous Days in, in HD on a Blu-ray rather than the DVD release. So there, there were opportunities. But having said all that, the Ultra HD Blu-ray, the final cut, looks and sounds absolutely spectacular. So um, I just basically just transferred the, that disc into my five-disc set. Bob's your uncle. I've got my nice <laughs> five-disc collection. <laughs> yeah, you, you're a very strange man, you. Uh, right. So that's. Uh... That's that. Comes. Sorry, I will, we'll just say one thing, just quickly mentioning that about different versions. The uh, Ultra HD Blu-ray of Close Encounters does include all three versions of the film in Ultra HD Blu-ray. So Columbia have certainly uh, done that on that release. So yep, good. I'm, I'm, I'm waiting on mine arriving. It's still in the post somewhere, so hopefully it'll arrive. I was hoping it was going to arrive today, actually, so I could watch it at the weekend, but... How long did it normally take, Steve? Because this is the first one I've bought. Usually, I, I'm, I would expect it to arrive today or tomorrow. Right, okay. So fingers crossed, because I, I really want to see that over the weekend. Right. Um, so the only other thing we need to talk about in terms of UHD Blu-ray news is the Dark Tower coming out, Steve. Yeah, the Dark Tower has got a release date. This is a Sony Pictures release, uh, 31st of October, and that will have Dolby Atmos and Dolby Vision. Uh, plus, also, I just read this this, this morning. Um, it was announced this morning or last night in the states. But Warner Brothers will be releasing the first four Harry Potter movies on Ultra HD Blu Blu-ray with with um, DTSX soundtracks, and that's going to be the week after this, the seventh of November, okay. for those those releases. Cool, right? So um, I saw an interesting advert at the cinema last night. I've also seen it on the TV a couple of times now, and it's an advert from Netflix, and it's basically um, it's the one stop place for you to go to get your fix of Star Trek and quite rightly because they've got all the series from the original series right the way through to the brand new series which kicks off on Monday Steve which is Star Trek Discovery um, that's the name of it it's not on the Discovery Channel um, so <laughs> this looks really interesting the the trailers the first trailer I was like mm, not sure about this second trailer it's it's got my interest I'm, I'm, I'm going to watch it but I guess the question here has to be is there still space for and excuse the pun, is there still space for for Star Trek? Uh, Are people still interested in it? Is it a franchise that has maybe run its course and and needs to die off for a couple of decades and then be revived again? Or can Discovery be be the thing to to reimagine, reinvigorate the the franchise? Because let's face it, the two, three, sorry, um, recent movies with the rebooted cast have not done great business. And, and the great means of things. So, Ed, what's your thoughts? This is a bit make or break. Uh, I think it's probably necessary to separate the movies from TV series. If we accept that Enterprise, bless it, tried some interesting ideas, but I frankly didn't care if the entire cast were, were vaporised in space, which is a bad place to start with any of these things. Um, it there is there's always scope for star in the same way that you know it whilst i stress that doctor who is not my cup of tea um as a character they they are they remain as relevant as ever uh, i think this so it is the case with um with, with star trek it just has to balance the um you know the the sort of slightly ca- contradictory requirements of you know showing humanity at its best and keeping us entertained by you know blowing stuff up from time to time it's it's not an easy thing to to get right and various series have done better than than others at, at showing that but i'm going to give it a crack of the way I, I i will be watching it so i you know i 
I hope that it's some some good. And, you know, if that's the case and Netflix, obviously, their calculations on what constitutes success are different and they get to show it across across the earth and all the rest of it. So I'm hoping that it does the numbers. And I hope that it, this is a jumping off point for some some other things. Mr. Borry, um, I, I think there's definitely uh, something that, that Star Trek can still offer. Um, whether this will be it, I'm not sure. Um, I think if it's if it's innovative if it's at least moves towards being vaguely science based and interesting in the the kind of story setups that it has um then i'll probably stick with it but um if it's just going to kind of descend into uh human drama and war like species and that kind of thing then i'll probably tune out just because i don't know it's it's just it's all been done before you know i'm i'm really want to see something kind of more self-contained episodes with just kind of you know interesting setups and that kind of thing you know just ex- explore a theme and just do it as well as you can in one episode and then move on right because I, th- I think this is going to be one story arc i think that's the approach they're going to take with this i don't think it's going to be standalone episodes where they have a different different story because if you look at, at recent tv series they've all gone with the the override story arc haven't they steve yeah, there's the. I mean, in the old days, our our episodes that were self-contained stories was the only way TV was done. But that's all been changed now. And, and if you look at something like Twin Peaks, most recently, that is just basically an eighteen-hour movie with a single story arc. And certainly with binge watching coming along, you can do that now. You can just have a single story. And I think it would be a retrograde step to do individual. I, I'd, I'd like to see the odds, the old episode though, maybe that was a standalone story. Um, if they did that, though, I don't think I'd have a complaint. You can still I'm have sure an overarching. Yeah, you can still you have can, the, the have overarching both. story, but it, you know, you go back to there are some, some series that did it better the old way. You go back and you watch something like The X Files when it was self-contained stories, and it was absolutely fantastic. As soon Monster as they tried, of the week, yeah, uh, yeah. But as soon as they tried to make it something longer running, kind of foreshadowing some great drama, it just turned into turgid dross. And I, I just, I'm, I'm not fully sure if. If kind of sci-fi, if if it necessarily suits this as much, um, you know, I, I think you can have it with, you know, it's, you get your stuff like, you know, The Walking Dead. You can have it with TV dramas, and that works. But with this, I'm, I just, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful that they can pull it off, but yet I just kind of feel that the grand drama of some alien race that plans to destroy us just will be so tired by the end. In um, Star Trek related, uh, does anyone know if that Seth MacFarlane vehicle is getting uh, a, an airing in the UK? The, oh, the yeah. Orville thing. Orville. I, I've seen. I saw a review of it. Um, it was on a US site, and it got absolutely panned. This is true, um, but then it actually then they said the second episode was rather. The second better. episode was much better, and the numbers are pretty good. Apparently, it's been doing quite well box office, um, right. you know, net, um, ratings wise. So. I'd, Hopefully Sky will pick it up because it's a Fox show, right? So, or well, it might be on FX as well. Oh uh, yeah, that. yeah. Well, I mean, I'm I'm just intrigued to see it. I mean, because again, that the the sort of critique that that's you know a, very much a homage as well to it's just a case of as going back to what it's just this balancing act, making sure that you you know making sure that it it does have you know you, as doing sort of noble things, but just not tedious at the same time and i appreciate that that's not an easy thing to to get right and it lives or dies on the quality of the people being asked to do it i mean let's face it if you took many of the jean-luc picard lines and gave them to someone who just wasn't as good as patrick stewart it would sound (laughs) it would sound shite (laughs) and that's half half the issue i'm looking forward to discovering obviously i'll be watching it um i'm slightly concerned about its very troubled production history and the fact that they're not showing it to to critics before the first screening so we'll see um have you seen the on the next generation though i didn't realize this when they were getting doing the the sort of pre-production they were absolutely uh roddenberry was absolutely adamant that uh patrick stewart couldn't be bald and yeah, there are some yeah. crack there are some cracking photos of him in in the hairpiece that roddenberry was insisting he he wore and it's like mm, I, I think that that that's a a, a a bullet dodged there. But yeah, I thought that was quite amusing. Always always to, always room for a hairpiece in space. I also watched on YouTube the scenes they shot with uh, Genevieve Bujold as, as Jane away before they sacked her for being 
crap and it's such a different i mean thank god they did that because because her take was um very weak um and uh yeah she clearly wasn't enjoying the whole experience it takes you it you need to have a certain mindset i mean it amuses me that um what's i can't remember the na- woman's name Muldrew or whatever uh, it doesn't hey, doesn't appear doesn't appear to have a huge grasp of actual science but she was confident enough in in the in the yeah. context of the crypto science bollocks that 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 star trek relies upon so you know i thought that apparently that applied to most of the cast they would just be given these pages of scientific jargon by the guys that wrote that bits because there, there were guys there were guys who wrote the screenplay you know, the scripts but there were also guys whose job was to add in the scientific cobblers and they've given pages of this stuff and they'd have to read it out and apparently they had a big row well, i think it was terry farrell who had a row with the guy said please stop giving me this stuff to read when i'm trying to do something else because i can't do two the two things at the same time they'd always have to stop crypto the action. science are you telling me that reversing the polarity won't solve all of our problems <laughs> <laughs> only some of them mark if all else fails if, if you're on the brink of being blown up reroute the power <laughs> yes <laughs> many a time that's come come back to help me Rerouting the power. Yeah. Well, we haven't heard Hodge's view on this at all. So, Hodge, uh, I think he's got the scope to do all right in, in terms of the streaming services. There's enough middle-aged blokes, you know, with access to Netflix as, a, as this show <laughs> ably proves. But I've just got the feeling. <laughs> and nothing better to do. And nothing better to do with the time. Uh, and uh, you know, there isn't a lot of sci-fi on Netflix. Oh, I suppose there is quite a bit, but not, not that style. Um, but yeah, I just think it's going to be total shite. <laughs> 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 and, on, and on that bombshell, uh, that is it for the podcast this week. We've outstayed our welcome yet again. So my thanks to Steve Withers. We're being paid back for our arrogance. Mark Hodgkinson. See you soon. Ed Selly. This is not the kind of shit I want on my transcript. And Mark Borey. God, I'm sorry. Don't forget, you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook, bookmarkavforums.com for latest reviews, news and video, and of course, leave us the five star ratings on iTunes, um, but only if you enjoyed the show. Don't leave us a four or a three, or it has to be five star ratings. I'm Phil Hinton, thanks for listening, and we'll see you again next week, but Ed won't. No, but I'll see you on the other side, flatliners style. <laughs> Good luck, Ed. Yeah.